So today, I want to share with you three images. And the first I mentioned a bit earlier is this uh, comforter that's down here. Um, the second one that I want to talk to you about is an umbrella. And uh, I do have one, I'll, ha I'll show you in a minute. And the third one is a tree or a plant. And uh, we have some lovely fake plants here. Uh, but, uh, but you can more easily imagine a tree and a plant than, than this comforter that I want to show you. So the first one I want to talk to you about is this blanket. This is, uh, this is my daughter's old comforter from her bed uh, from when she was a bit younger, when she was about three years, maybe two or three years old, she got this. It's actually really big. I could uh, easily cover myself up completely with this blanket. And I don't know about you, but there have been a lot of days in the last six weeks where I have wanted to completely cover myself up with a blanket and never come out of it. Uh, and so maybe you felt like that sometimes. Uh, in fact, this uh, comforter usually sits on our, um, uh, on our couch downstairs, one of our couches downstairs in our basement. And there have been times where I have, uh, I have to confess, I've gone downstairs and taken a nap on our very comfortable couch and covered myself up with this comforter. <laughs> so you can imagine that. Um, it's actually really comfortable. Um, but I want you to think about, and I, I was kind of thinking about how when Juliet would go to sleep or our child is getting into bed and they bring the blankets up and they're, they're wanting to be cozy and they're wanting to feel... Uh, you know, good before going to bed and all that kind of thing. Um, and as a parent, I want her to feel safe and secure and loved. And, uh, and so we'll, you know, tuck her in and, and make sure she's feeling okay for the night as best we can. And I actually think that this is a great image for us about how God wants us to feel God actually wants us to feel safe and secure in him. Uh, God wants us to be able to get a good sleep at night. And sometimes it's really hard, and we really need God's comfort. Uh, the passage we just heard, Jesus promises another advocate, is the, the translation we heard. The King James Version, some of you might be familiar with that, uh, translates this word as comforter, another comforter. And when I was thinking about that, that's why this image popped into my head. Not one who comforts, but an actual comforter, like an actual security blanket, is what it made me think of. Jesus promises, I'm going, but, but I'm going to send you another comforter. And this, this word another is important because Jesus isn't just saying, uh, I'm going to send you a comforter, as in the Holy Spirit. That's who he's talking about. The Holy Spirit is going to come and be a comforter for you. Um, but another one, as in Jesus was the, was the first one. As in, I'm here with you, Jesus is saying, but I'm going to go away, he says to his disciples, and I'm going to send you another comforter besides me. And it reminded me of the, the text in Matthew 28 uh, sorry, Matthew 11, verse 28, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So that's our first uh, image today, is this comforter that, that can wrap around us and give us rest, help us to feel secure in God and loved by God. Our second image uh, I have right here, here's my umbrella. Um, now, if my mom's watching, she'll freak out because she always said, don't ever open an umbrella indoors, but I'm going to do it anyway. So there we go. Oh, you can see that it's, it's kind of an old umbrella. Um, so this is, uh, this is my umbrella. And um, I probably can't hold this for the entire time that I'm going to preach, so maybe I will close that now. But um, so this week, I, I it was we had, we had a few days of rain this week, which is uh, well, I guess it's normal for this time of the year. But I think everybody is wanting days of sun. Like today is this beautiful sunny day in Winnipeg, 
And um, I like to get out and go for a walk if I can on my own and uh, just clear my head and things like that. And I hadn't gone for a walk in a while. And I was just having a down day. I was having one of those days where I was just kind of feeling sad and sort of gloomy and it really matched the weather. And I know lots of us have that where it's like, well, is, am I sad and the weather is matching it or is the weather making me sad and uh, what's going on there? Uh, but I just had this urge to go and go for a walk in the rain. And I never do this. I don't really enjoy walking in the rain very much. So what compelled me to go for a walk in the rain this week I don't know for sure. Like, maybe I was just embracing the sadness, like channeling my inner Eeyore or something like that, where I was just thinking, okay, I'm just going to go. I'm going to get out of the house. I'm, gonna, I'm not feeling good about this, and I'm just going to go and drown my sorrows in the rain. And, uh, and as I was walking, um, oh, I should have kept the umbrella open so I could show you. Okay, we'll, we'll open it one more time. Mom, it's okay. It'll, it'll all be okay. Um, as I'm... As I'm uh, walking, I don't know if you've, you've had this experience, if you're walking with an umbrella and then the wind catches it, right, and you, it kind of jerks like this, right? Like it kind of starts to pull, uh, pull, pull away, away from you. Um, and so that was happening. It was a bit windy. It wasn't too windy and I was able to kind of angle my umbrella to kind of stop that a little bit. So the wind was tugging it and it made me think of something uh, really interesting as I was in my sadness walking around, having the, the tug on this uh, umbrella, it made me think of Mary Poppins. <laughs> and, um, so if you know the story of Mary Poppins, the book, or more likely the movie is the one I know. I haven't read the book, but I, I know the movie really well. And, um, and Mary Poppins, she uh, has her umbrella, and she flies in uh, on the wind, basically. She flies in as this nanny who's going to take care of these children. So the Banks family is looking for a new nanny, and, uh, and Mary Poppins ends up being the solution. Uh, what's interesting about when Mary Poppins first shows up in that movie, it's probably about 15 minutes into the movie where she finally shows up as the re responding to this ad for a nanny for the family. She, um, there's, this, there's this big wind that blows through, and all of the other nannies that are applying for the job are lined up outside the house uh, waiting to come in for interviews. And the wind blows them all away. And some of them you see like have umbrellas and they're, they're kind of being blown down the street. And then it kind of cuts to Mary Poppins and she's got her umbrella open and the same wind and she's completely untouched by the wind, right? And, and it's just totally controlled and she's perfectly, uh, perfect posture and she just arrives. And um, I think this is kind of an interesting image for us. Uh, some of you might know, right, the Holy Spirit, the same word for spirit and wind are used in the Bible for the Holy Spirit. Wind and spirit are the same word. So while other nannies are blown away by the wind, this uncontrollable force, somehow Mary Poppins rides it in a very proper way. Now, Mary Poppins herself as a character, I think is actually quite hard to describe succinctly and quickly without having gone and seen the movie. So go watch it. If you've never seen it, go and watch the movie. She is both playful and proper. She both follows all of the rules and enforces those rules on the children that she's caring for and then somehow seems to bend or break all the rules with sort of a mischievous look in her eye at the same time. She somehow does that. Um, in her interview, which isn't really, it ends up being her interviewing the father, really, um, one of the things that she was responding to was this letter that the children sent out and what they wanted in a nanny and what they wanted, one of their criteria was, must be kind. And her response to that was, I am kind, but extremely firm. Uh, she seems to really believe in the truth and in correction when someone is stepping outside of the boundaries. She corrects the children, yet somehow she builds this incredible bond of love with the children, even though she's always showing them, here's where you stepped out of line, but she also has fun with them. And it occurred to me as I was thinking about Mary Poppins, she's actually a great image 
for the Holy Spirit, right? One who is playful and yet corrects us. One who is kind but also firm. One who will always lead us to truth but somehow does it the same way Mary Poppins does it with a twinkle in her eye. The word that we have for the Holy Spirit in our text is the word advocate. And it's interesting to think of this word because this is actually, the word is actually paraclete in, in Greek, uh, the word paraclete. And, um, and it comes from a verb that means to come alongside. And when we think about this idea of coming alongside or advocating for someone else. And if you know the story of Mary Poppins, you might ask, well, for whom is Mary Poppins an advocate? Like she comes in as a nanny for the children and, and is she kind of advocating for the children? Well, Cheryl and I, uh, my wife and I started watching Saving Mr. Banks the other night. We haven't gotten all the way through it yet. Um, and it's a kind of a, a, about the making of Mary Poppins in a way. Uh, and so it's about uh, uh, Mrs. Travers, who's the, the, the author of the original book, and Walt Disney trying to buy the rights of uh, Mary Poppins uh, to make the movie. And um, at one point, Walt Disney says something like, he's saying about how much he loves this nanny who has come to save these children. And uh, P.L. Travers says back to him, you think she came to save the children? Oh, dear. Because, of course, she came to save the father. She came to save Mr. Banks, not the children. All right, here's our third image, and it's the tree or the plant or really the vine and the branches. This is the passage that comes pretty much right after the one that we read. So Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit coming and then shifts towards using this image of the vine and the branches being connected. But this theme of being connected is throughout much of John 13, 14, and 15. And so we read in our passage, on that day, so this is like when the Holy Spirit is going to come, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. That's John 14, 20. Jesus encourages his disciples when he talks about the vine and the branches. He says, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And a little bit farther in John 15, that was John 15 verse 4, a little bit farther in uh, verses 9 and 11, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Previously in John 13, Jesus washed his disciples' feet, a sign of service. And then, in that same conversation with them, he issued them what's called the new commandment, which isn't really that new at all because it's embedded in the Old Testament as well. But Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, so you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's John 13, 34 to 35. You see how the commandment and following what Jesus asks of us and love are bound up together, right? This is, again, why maybe Mary Poppins is a good example of who the Holy Spirit is because that's what she does with the children. She somehow embodies this strict uh, way of being proper and doing the right thing and yet it's all bound up with love and play and goodness. And we are called to abide in this love, in Jesus' love, to abide in it, to live 
in it, to be like the vine and the branches, right? We're connected. The branch cannot produce without its connection. This is, Jesus uses this image of vine and branches as a way of helping us to understand what it means to abide. Abiding isn't just kind of being near. It's connected. It's intimately connected. You actually can't really have a branch. You cannot have a healthy branch without it being attached to the vine or to the tree. This is the image he chooses to talk about abiding. And I actually have trouble with this image. I have a hard time getting my head around it. I can imagine abiding in a house, like that's my abode, right? That's where I live. I can abide in there. And I can, ab- I can imagine abiding with a person, right? So I can actually get my head around one who comes alongside or helper or advocate. But even those words and even the word comforter are actually, in the end, insufficient images for talking about the Holy Spirit. Because it isn't enough to only abide with, as in abide next to, the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls us to abide in, to have this connection. And I think maybe that's why he uses the vine and branches metaphor of connection. See, I think lots of us, and and I'll include myself in this, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, when it comes to connecting to Jesus in the present, which is, that's who the Holy Spirit is, is the presence of Jesus Christ with us. But not just with us, but in us and us in him. When it comes to that, I think a lot of us might be, uh, it's kind of like we've got a blanket or a comforter and it's sitting next to us and we're saying, well, I'm, I'm abiding, I'm, I'm here, I'm alongside, the blankets come alongside me, but I'm still freezing. And we've forgotten, oh wait, we have to actually take the blanket and wrap it around us. We can't just abide next to, we have to abide in. We have to take the blanket and put it on. And I think this is, it's actually a transformation that takes place. And again, if you are familiar with this beautiful movie I've been talking about today, or if you're not, go and watch it. But this is what happens at the end of the movie. What happens is, is that Mr. Banks learns to love and abide in his children. At the end of the movie, so spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, sorry, uh, but at the end of the movie, he wants to play with his children just to be with them. And, uh, and that's where we get the song, let's go fly a kite, right? So they, they decide, we're going to go fly kites and have fun. And what's, this is great storytelling, by the way, because what happens at the beginning of the movie, Mary Poppins flies in on the wind And then at the end of the movie, everybody's flying kites in the wind, and Mary flies away again. And she's done what she needed to do. And so what happens at the end of that film, it's actually not about Mary Poppins in the end of the movie. It's that Mr. Banks has been invited into what Mary Poppins has set up with his children. And this is precisely what the Spirit of God does. The Holy Spirit invites you into what Jesus has set up. And in fact, abiding in the Holy Spirit means abiding in Jesus abiding in his love, and then being able to love others as he loves them. So you are invited to receive the Holy Spirit like a blanket surrounding you, keeping you warm, like riding on the wind, like playing with your kids, like a branch connected to the healthiest of trees. 
You are invited to abide in the Holy Spirit. Amen.